Celebrating 43 years on the air, Farm Week is a production of Mississippi State University Extension. Today on Farm Week, another wild week in trade, many pushing for passage of the USMCA while new tariffs are levied on China. Plus, we'll meet a man who spent three decades investigating fraud for the USDA. In Southern Gardening, if you think bigger is better, you'll like this whopper of a story. And in our feature, Aquaculture, one family's all-American dream. Farm Week starts right now. Hello everyone, I'm Mike Russell. Thanks for joining us today on Farm Week. Without a trade deal so far, the U.S. has imposed yet more tariffs on Chinese goods. By December, they could top more than half a trillion dollars. In the meantime, in what could be considered a campaign to boost the spirits of farmers suffering trade war fatigue, a bipartisan crew went calling on the Midwest. Here's Paul Yeager. The push for USMCA passage came to an Iowa dairy production facility this week. Former USDA Secretary and current U.S. Dairy Export Council CEO Tom Vilsack, along with Iowa Senator Charles Grassley, toured the Anderson Erickson production facility in the capital city of Des Moines. AE does not export their products, but says trade does help the entire industry. The message centered on jobs that could be created if the United States-Mexico-Canada deal is ratified by all three countries. Uh, not only does it preserve and protect our number one market, Mexico, uh, which is incredibly important uh, as being a tariff-free market, but it also creates an opportunity for us to protect certain cheese names. The dairy industry has struggled in recent times, and Vilsack says more than 2,000 dairy producers have gone out of business over the last two years reducing the number of operations to 39,000. It's an opportunity to get more poultry products, particularly into Canada, and there's an opportunity to get uh, higher quality wheat into Canada than we have under the NAFTA agreement. But also, uh, NAFTA needed to be modernized, but altogether, this is important for agriculture, for manufacturing, uh, and for the future and the predictability of it. Senator Grassley is optimistic the U.S. Congress will ratify USMCA by the end of 2019. House Democrats have concerns over labor, environment, and overall enforcement of the entire pact. Trade was on the president's mind when he made several appearances in front of reporters at the G7 conference this week. And we're transforming our country. We're taking these horrible, one-sided, Foolish, very dumb, stupid, if you'd like to use that word, because it's so descriptive. We're taking these trade deals that are so bad, and we're making good, solid deals out of them. U.S. producers did get some positive trade news from the G7 involving Japan. It's a very big transaction, and we've agreed in principle. It's uh, billions and billions of dollars. Uh, tremendous for the farmers, and uh, one of the things that Prime Minister Abi has also agreed to is we have excess corn uh, in various parts of our country uh, with our farmers because China did not uh, uh, do what they said they were going to do. President Trump said Japan has agreed to purchase U.S. produced commodities like pork, dairy, and ethanol to the world's third largest economy by GDP. It will lead to substantial reductions in tariffs and non-tariff barriers across the board. And I'll just give you one example. Japan is by far our biggest beef market. We sell over $2 billion worth of beef to Japan, and this will allow us to, to do so with lower tariffs and to compete more effectively with people across the board, particularly the TPP uh, countries and, and Europe. And the president also indicated he'd spoken with China following last week's escalation of tariffs between the two countries. China called last night our top trade people and said, let's get back to the table. So we'll be getting back to the table. And I think they want to do something. They've been hurt very badly, but they understand this is the right thing to do. And Chinese officials denied making calls to the U.S. shortly after President Trump made his statement. 
Many of the farmers caught on the crossfire of the trade war are preparing for the looming harvest of the commodities involved. Iowa Corn Growers Association board member Mark Mueller was at the trade group's meeting this week calling for the Trump administration to uphold the integrity of the renewable fuel standard. The biofuels future isn't the only elephant in the room impacting producers. Our present administration has done a lot of harm to agriculture like the small refinery exemptions. Corn demand is being decimated with the granting of these small refinery exemptions. I'm afraid that this administration is picking trade fights, starting trade wars, but doesn't have an end game in mind, doesn't have a plan on how to win these fights. A bit more on that ethanol backlash. It seems the patience of corn producers is dwindling. The National Corn Growers Association said in a recent statement that the president's actions have cost 2,700 jobs and compromised demand for more than 300 million bushels of corn. This a result, it says, of ethanol plant closures and slowing production. In comments issued just a few days ago to the EPA, Association President Lynn Crisp said, quote, NCGA has no confidence in the volumes EPA proposes for 2020. These refinery waivers have significantly outpaced annual increases in RFS volume requirements, taking RFS volume requirements backward. A current hemp case has revealed the disparity in state and federal laws of the emerging industry without consistent regulations in place. A truck carrying industrial hemp from Oregon to Colorado was stopped in Idaho earlier this year. There, hemp is still illegal. Despite the new farm bill, which says it is no longer a controlled substance and that states may not impede transportation of hemp, nearly a million and a half dollars of cargo was impounded. A legal battle is being fought in appellate court, and a criminal case is pending against the truck driver. The USDA has yet to finalize its rules on the crop, though it has released a legal opinion related to hemp transportation. Next week, we'll feature an interview with Mississippi Ag Commissioner Andy Gibson. He is also the chairman of the Mississippi Hemp Cultivation Task Force. The state may be in a unique position to influence the outcome of the hemp dialogue. Gibson says it's the only state in the union with a 50-year history of direct research. So what is meat? Well, hoping to answer that question, five cell-based meat companies have formed a coalition called the Alliance for Meat, Poultry and Seafood Innovation. The group says it is, quote, working to advance new methods of producing real, high-quality, safe meat, poultry, and seafood products directly from animal cells. The heavily financed coalition says it expects its products to be in restaurants and on grocery store shelves within the next several years. Well, believe it or not, despite record prevent plant acreage, the USDA projected just a few days ago that net farm income will reach upwards of $88 billion this year. That would actually be an increase of just under 5% over last year. So what's behind the increase? Well, it turns out, according to Politico, that farm income has been reinforced by a 43% increase in direct government payments to farmers, including nearly $20 billion in subsidies like trade relief and disaster aid. The USDA says farm exports to China are expected to increase slightly in 2020. On the lighter side, so if bigger is better for you when it comes to color, this could be the segment for you. Here's horticulturist Dr. Gary Bachman with a plant that has a familiar name and a whopper of a reputation. A certain burger joint got famous for selling a whopper, but today I'm going to tell you about a completely different kind of whopper. We're at the South Mississippi Branch Station in Poplarville looking at a plant that lives up to that name. Of course, I'm referring to the 2019 Mississippi Medallion winning Whopper Begonias. These large begonias command awe, dazzling gardeners with big three inch blooms and out of sight color from spring to the fall season. Now begonias are typically thought of as shade plants but the Whopper series can handle the full sun and intense heat of our Mississippi summers, as long as adequate water is supplied. They grow larger and fuller when grown in full sun, 
than those begonias grown in the shade. There are four Whopper begonia varieties available. Red with green leaf displays large red blooms complemented by cool green leaves. Red with bronze leaf improved produces red blooms with shimmery bronze leaves. Rose with bronze leaf improved produces rose colored blooms along with gleaming bronze leaves. And rose with green leaf improved produces rose colored blooms complemented by refreshing green leaves. Deadheading is not necessary to promote reblooming. These Whopper begonias are not winter hardy, but who cares with their spring to fall color display? With large leaves and enormous flowers, I know which Whopper I like the best. I'm horticulturist Gary Bachman, and I'll see you next time on Southern Gardening. Thanks, Gary. Fraud in agriculture, it may be a little more common than you think, especially as margins have tightened and uncertainty has increased. In this piece, we meet Don Doles, who gives us unusual insight into the darker side of the ag world. Here's Colleen Bradford Krantz. In early 2005, a data analytics center hired by the federal government contacted investigator Don Doles with some unusual findings. Doles never suspected the information would kick off the biggest case of his career. Within months, Doles would be placing hidden cameras and rushing for his pistol to save his life. Doles wasn't an ATF or FBI agent. He was in a job most might assume is a bit less traumatic. Agricultural investigator with the USDA Office of Inspector General. The information given to Doles sent him after a North Carolina crop insurance agent and a network of more than 50 people who had defrauded the federal crop insurance program of an estimated $100 million. They don't play. I mean, it's, it's a lot of money. So uh, farmers, uh, especially these organized groups, don't take well to local people turning them in. And so they, they can get by. Yeah, I've had contracts out on me before. Doles, who retired after 29 years of agricultural investigative work, estimates the percentage of USDA cases involving wrongdoing is in line with those of other federal programs. Most farmers are, are honest people, and, and they just want to be left alone. Funny thing is that very little farming goes on without some sort of federal involvement now. And most of them try to do right. Market to Market analyzed data from the annual reports of the USDA Office of Inspector General and found a rough relationship between a drop in net farm income and an increase in the number of federal investigations and convictions. By 2002, net farm income had dipped to the lowest point since the 1980s farm crisis. Within a few years, Doles and other investigators would be on the tail of Robert Carl Stokes, a Wilson, North Carolina crop insurance agent. Stokes had brought together a group of area farmers who underreported their harvest to the government and quietly sold the hidden portions to complicit buyers. Stokes' company, the Hallmark Agency, came to the attention of federal investigators after number crunchers noticed an unusually high frequency of payouts. Doles called a friend at the Risk Management Agency, which oversees privately contracted federal crop insurance, and asked what he knew about Hallmark. His RMA contact said a man had reached out to him just the day before, saying he had information to share. The next day I called a plane, flew up and met with him in the parking lot of a church, and he laid out the, what was going on, and it was dead on. He provided us with 10 names of farmers he knew were involved and we went back and pulled the records and sure enough it was clear that they were cheating the program. Understanding the dangers of going undercover, the man hesitated to get more deeply involved. He felt he was in danger because there were so many farmers that were involved. It turned out that the 10 or so names he gave us was just the tip of the iceberg. A Wilson area farmer, who was unaware of the insurance fraud scheme at the time, 
believes the man's fears were justified. I would hate to think I had to rat on a neighbor. That's why I don't like to know anything at all, because it's a good way to wake up dead one morning. <laughs> By 2006, the man had changed his mind and agreed to work undercover. Doles and his team then asked the informant to infiltrate Stokes' crop insurance crew. We would put a microphone and a small recorder in his pocket, and uh, later on we used a camera. Looks like a button. Well, he went down to the place called Liberty Warehouse, and the owner there said, yeah, I'll provide you with these false invoices for your tobacco sales, but you got to pay me. For Doles and a fellow investigator, one arrest took a sudden violent turn. Well, we got there, and he took off for the for his cab of his truck. When well, I'm right behind him, and uh, we get to the truck cab, and he's reaching into the center console. When he did, I put the pistol up the heck of his ear, and I said, if you reach in there, I'll kill you right where you sit. Shortly after Stokes' arrest, the informant died of natural causes. Never knowing the web of convictions would involve 57 people in multiple states. In order to carry it out, it required people willing to break the law at a number of levels. Stokes, who served nearly two years in prison, lost his home and his insurance business. He died in 2016. While Stokes' wife didn't defend his actions, she did say local farmers weren't a bunch of lambs being led to the slaughter. Todd Glover, a Wilson farmer, was surprised about some of the producers who were involved. The farmers were struggling to, to, to make money and, and, and things was really tight back then, like they are today. And I think that caused some people to do things that they normally wouldn't do. Every farmer in every county where this occurred, whether they know it or not, uh, was victimized because their insurance premiums went up. Honest farmers were screaming, "Yo, you got to do something. You got to stop this. They're killing us. They're, they're running the rent up on us, and we can't stay in the business. We'll take a short break, but coming up on Farm Week, we're headed down to the Gulf. You think New Orleans, you think seafood, right? That's where you'll find this family, experts in aquaculture over the years and the shrimping business big time. In an industry that's competitive in every way, like land-based farmers, they're out early in the morning, bringing home the day's catch, still competing against foreign companies, still pursuing the American dream after half a century. Forrest Gump would be proud. We're in Nolens. Coming up on Farm Week. Don't go away. At Mississippi State University, Extension is reaching beyond the college campus and impacting adult education. We're instructing agricultural professionals on the latest trends in research and technology, inspiring communities, empowering small businesses, and promoting the growth of healthy families where youth and adults can reach their fullest potential. The MSU Extension Service, sharing our vision for the future. Before we get back to the show, let's take a look at the Farm Week calendar. First, the always popular Mississippi Gourd Festival, Friday and Saturday, September 20th and 21st at the Smith County Ag Complex in Raleigh, Mississippi several gourd crafting classes and artists from around the country will be there too. Cost is two dollars, parking is free. For more information call Mike Thompson at 601-374-0245. Next it's Breakfast on the Farm October 17th through 19th from 9 to noon at the Bearden Dairy Center at MSU in Starkville. Learn where your food comes from, milk a cow, tour the dairy. The first two days are for school field trips. The 19th, that's a Saturday, is open to the public. Registration opens this fall. For more info, call Amanda Stone at 662-769-9941. Now, check out this week's Farm Week Snapshot. Always good to end on an up note. For the last couple of weeks, we've been telling you about this piece, a family living the all-American dream in aquaculture. 
Of course, America does compete with companies overseas, and that combined with tough environmental laws makes it harder for American companies to succeed. But sometimes those odds just don't matter. Here's Delaney Howell from our news partner Market to Market with the story. The business of seafood can be treacherous, with many variables challenging producers. For one Louisiana seafood company, success has been measured by a pickup truck and one firm handshake at a time. After a mission trip in the late 1980s, Tommy DeLon moved back to Louisiana with his new wife. He decided to start a family and a new career in New Orleans. They just pursued the American dream and started building their business with a pickup truck, working early mornings, driving down to the docks, two, three, four o'clock every morning, getting the day's fresh catch, and then bringing it right back to the city to sell to all of the best restaurants in the quarter. In the years that followed their pursuit of the American dream, the DeLons would expand what is now Tommy's Seafood. They brought their children into the mix, and in the early 1990s started to vertically integrate. We have control over, uh, of course, over the catch, from the moment that it's unloaded all the way to the final packaging uh, at the last stage before it makes it to the consumer. So we, uh, our fishermen that we work with, they harvest the seafood for us, we unload it, we send it to our other facilities, we process it, we package it, uh, we store it, we ship it, and it's ready for the rest of the world to enjoy. Tommy's Seafood sells several types of shrimp, oysters, and blue crab but the company's seafood mix is only part of their success. One way the DeLons are trying to sustain their family operation is to rely on the tools used decades ago when the business was taking its first steps. Growing up in St. Bernard Parish allowed me to be able to cultivate all of these longstanding relationships that, uh, that, that my family had or that I was able to make along the way with other families who have uh, multi-generational fishing in their blood. So uh, it is without a doubt one of the reasons why we're able to be so successful in this business. Of the 3.6 billion pounds of seafood landed in the contiguous 48 states, more than 1 million of that total comes ashore in Louisiana. In 1990, the U.S. shrimp catch was just over 18 million pounds with an estimated value of $75 million. Almost three decades later, the 2018 harvest was 40% smaller at around 11 million pounds, and the final tally cut nearly in half to come in at just over $40 million. You know, we face not just competition here domestically, okay, although it's friendly competition, but we face a lot of competition overseas. So we consume about a billion pounds of shrimp here in the United States each year, and 90% of that comes from overseas, and that's 90% and counting. So you know, their objective is to completely eliminate the domestic industry. We're without a doubt the underdogs in this business. The Pelican State's seafood industry recently received some help from Louisiana Legislature and Governor John Bell Edwards. Last month, a new law was passed requiring food establishments to notify customers when the seafood they are being served is from a foreign source. The measure was introduced to put local commercial fishermen into the spotlight and help boost small town economies along Louisiana's coast. Besides weathering the storm of ever-changing markets with overseas competitors, Tommy's Seafood has to navigate through an ecosystem that can force changes to their product line in a flash. Prior to Hurricane Katrina in 2005, the industry, the waters, the marshlands, they were a lot different than what they were today. So we started seeing a whole lot more crabs show up in this area and a whole lot less shrimp. So that was another reason why we changed our tactics of just putting all of our focus on shrimp and diversifying more into crabs. Now, we unload more crabs at our dock than we do shrimp. Prior to Hurricane Katrina, it used to be the other way around. So, uh, you know, we're just finding ways to, to be creative and to make sure that we can still sustain ourselves. Those long-standing relationships are the backbone of their operation. 
Over the past five decades, the Delons have expanded their reach across the Pacific to markets in Asia. They are hopeful their reputation will help them move across the Atlantic as they begin researching market opportunities in the European Union. The Delons have no plans to stop building on their successes and will continue to stick to the family's main principles of quality product, reliable delivery, and making a deal one handshake at a time. Our Louisiana slogan, the official state motto is feed your soul, right? And so I think that they go hand in hand with one another. When you think Louisiana, you think seafood, you think food, you think culture, and it's just a, a big medley of awesomeness down here. In addition to their processing plant, the Delon family operates a French Creole restaurant in New Orleans in Tommy's Fish House, just outside Baton Rouge. A great success story. Well, next time on Farm Week, beef demand up, leather demand down. Yep, you heard right. At a time when beef is definitely what's for dinner, all those hides from the herd are turning to bovine blight. For centuries, leather has been the choice for boots, bags, and ways to bundle up. But times are changing, and those tanned hides are competing with faux leather and cheap labor. So what's take two at the tanneries? Find out next time on Farm Week. Once again, if you missed a story, look for past episodes of the show on our website at farmweek.tv and consider following us on Facebook and Twitter. We'll see you next week. Thanks for watching.